and I got narrowed down to Museum of Tower Hamlets. And as Tower Hamlets doesn't support us in any real way, uh, <laughs> no. yeah. So we're mo mostly going to concentrate on the history of the building, the, the, story, uh, the, the story of the ragged schools, um, the story of Bernardo, and the history of philanthropy in the East End. Can you tell me a bit about that? Because as you know, the project I run is inspired by right. the ragged schools. Oh, right. So, yeah, sure. So uh, I well, love the tradition. Well, yes, of course. Well, of course, the origins of the ragged schools are lost in the mists of time, really. Nobody knows who created the first one, um, where they exactly got the name from. Uh, and that's what's interesting. Uh, that's what uh, we think is a challenge to cover because um, we know that in 1844, four men got together in London to form the Ragged School Union. Apart from that, I don't think we know where the name comes from. But uh, recently I did go to Portsmouth where they were commemorating the 200th anniversary of the birth of John Pounds. He was a, a cobbler in Portsmouth. He clearly is certainly one of the first founders of the notion. I don't know if you know, you know him? Yes. Yes, of course you do. There you go. Well, you know, it's, it's striking looking at his history and it's clearly his living in obscurity in Portsmouth for all of his life. It was at the time of his death that uh, people become, became aware of his work. And then Thomas Guthrie in Edinburgh took up that mantle and talked about second market schools. And as I say, I suppose the, the firm fixed date, in a way, is 1844 and the formation of the Ragged School Union and getting Lord Shaftesbury to become the president of the Ragged School Union. And that's when you start to get some, some documentation. But the problem is, generally, that because they were informal, because there was no sort of overarching organisation, the Ragged School Union was kind of mutual self-help organisation. Therefore, archives are fragmentary. They exist in various places at various times. Therefore, there's no, there's no continuous history. For instance, nothing was written in the 20th century of any substance. There were some PhDs done about individual ragged schools around the country, but there's no, there was just a pamphlet that Claire Seymour, who was the uh, museum director, effectively, at the time, wrote. But nothing else was written and published publicly uh, about ragged schools in the 20th century. You pick up on that board about the, the tradition of philanthropy. Yes. When we look at all cultures yeah. throughout all times, yeah. there is a tradition no, philanthropy. of philanthropy. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's absolutely key. And I think it's got, as state took over so many functions, philanthropy tended to be looked at as some, somewhat some old-fashioned notion from the 19th century. And very often philanthropists put portrayed as sort of condescending do-gooders who are condemnatory about the poor. But I don't see it that way at all. I see particularly the Ragged School Union, sorry, seeing their role as being the, what I call, the teacher man to fish brigade, enabling people. And I think that's such a powerful notion, enabling people, giving an education and skills. And it's very notable how... Ragged school teachers very often kept in touch with their pupils. In fact, somebody's been here, unfortunately, I didn't get her card at the time, but she's doing a PhD on a group of letters to a ragged school teacher who kept in touch with his pupils for, for a, a long time afterwards. And as you can see, you know, issuing certificates, because before the world of GCSEs and other kinds of qualifications, you needed something to show that you were an sort of upright, good worker, as it were. So medals and certificates were very important. And I see there's a, a beehive. Oh, well, there was wonderful imagery. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's one there. You can see the silver medal, which is good conduct medal. There's the beehive for the industrious bee, but also the cornucopia, you can see. There you go. So sort of the horn of plenty. And at watch as well, to sh you know, another award to show that you were a good, upstanding person. So, yes. And if you come uh, around here, for instance, uh, and you see where the need was. We were fortunate that Bernardo's let us have material from their archives. And these, and the, the extraordinary thing about their archive is that Bernardo took a photograph of every child who came into his care. Therefore, you get sort of a photograph on admission, photograph on leaving. 
possibly, or sometime afterwards. And time after time, as you can see from the attendance register, the great catastrophe, and it was a catastrophe, was the death of the breadwinner. Because women could barely survive and bring up children. Because yeah. the options available to them are so few. And I think people don't recognise as well that accommodation was very insecure. People moved a lot because you know, they couldn't afford the rents. Accommodation was dismal and ghastly. Because that's the other thing that the ragged schools, it's very clear, Bernardo, who'd been involved in ragged schooling right from his earliest days... And when he landed in London in 1866, he was teaching at one in Ernest Street, which is just north of here. It was considered to be a very rough area, certainly related to the booth, you know, the booth maps and the booth researchers. And then he set up his own in 18, 1868. And this school, he took over the lease of the building, the building we're actually standing in now. And uh, he set up the school in 1877. But then in 1879, he's appealing for funds to feed the, the children, because I think a lot of them would recognise that, that the children were coming to school without having had any breakfast or anything substantial. So that became mm. another issue. So tell me more about this man. You know, I know it's, it's hard to peer into the history. Well, Bernardo is, yeah. uh, I mean, it's sometimes controversial, <laughs> uh, but he's born in Ireland in 1845 into a reasonably prosperous family. His father was a Prussian subject. Bernardo was one of a number of children by, by his father's second wife and the sister of his deceased first wife. Um, Bernardo was apprenticed to the wine trade, which is unusual given what and how he ended up. His brothers went to Trinity's College, Dublin. but He got a religious conversion in his teens. He saw himself brought to God. He heard about something called the British, the China Inland Mission. He was going to go to China as a medical missionary. And that's what brought him to this neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. He is lodging just north of here, just north of Mile End Road. He, he arrives in a particularly catastrophic year, both for the country and London in particular. A major bank had collapsed over and in Gurney, destroying fortunes, and therefore lots of the workers relied on the wealthy people. The harvests had not been good because agricultural workers were beginning to leave the, the land to go to the cities and apparently harvest spoiled. And then finally, the, the real catastrophe was a cholera epidemic, which affected London and the East End in particular, where you know, people lived in really poor conditions. And Bernardo recognised that if he wanted to do missionary work, he should be in London as well as in China, so he stayed in London. And then later he had, I mean, he was a, he could color, he could be colorful about his stories about his life. He recalls meeting a boy called Jim Jarvis and who he finds is sleeping on the streets. And he finds that there are lots of other boys sleeping on the streets. And that's when he starts his mission to house boys, look after them, train them and so on. And that's the beginnings of his work with the children. I mean, a lot of the children eventually came into his care weren't orphans as such well like a lot of the ones that are described here it's because usually there's a mother who cannot cope with four six even eight children yeah. and then his work can extend into all kinds of things he ran a medical mission he took over a pub down the road there bought it for four thousand pounds called the edinburgh castle that was the center of his mission he ran he as i say he ran clinics from there he then extended his work into looking after girls and set up a girls' village home where girls, say 20 girls, were looked after by a house mother in a set of really beautifully designed cottages around a green. And then there were various brigades. There was blue black, uh, shoe, black, shoe blacking brigades. He had um, water, he produced water. Um, he produced night and day, uh, which is a, a how he appeal to his supporters. This was a... A, a, journal, a journal. journal. Yeah, I can show you some of that um, in the office. He produced a journal called Night and Day, which he appealed for funds, told about his work. He organised... Well, as his organisation grew and grew and grew, he eventually organised uh, biannual events at the Albert Hall. That perhaps, because it's in the news at the moment, because one of the controversial things that Bernardo was involved uh -huh. with, that people get a little anxious about these days, particularly these days, is the emigration of children. Mm -hmm. But I think it has to be seen in the context of the time. Clearly, sending fairly young children, probably early teenagers maybe, off to, to Canada, some of them are going to have a bad time and be miserable. Mm -hmm. Others did prosper. 
I mean, this not this is a story that sort of slightly gets forgotten because some of the, the whole idea behind the immigration was that Bernardo, for instance, was always looking at the nutritional status of countries and and in and comes out in night and day. And he'll point out that Australia is better than Britain, that Canada's better than Britain. The, the, they went as indentured servants to begin with, but the person receiving them had to have a reference from a doctor and from a clergyman. They were prepared carefully for agricultural work, though you can imagine it must have been hard for some of them, were street kids. And the, for a, I can't remember the timings now, but for a certain amount of time, they're indentured servants. But after that time, they have wages, and wages are negotiated by the Bernardo organisation. It's paid into a bank account, and, at the, and when, they be, when they reach the age of 21, they get their bank book. And they, the idea is they could buy land. Yeah. yeah. So what, what some, of the, some, some of the philanthropic ideas behind this was that you escape the stigma of poverty. And I just have to say that the two people I've met in this building, no, when I met at Holiday, their stories of emigration to Canada have been very successful. So, I, of course, we wouldn't do it now. Of course, we've got notions of children and their attachment to family and so on, but things were different then. And what tended to happen was the woman left as a widow with a group of children and she cannot feed them all. She'd keep the younger one because they, they, they were needing care and she'd send the older one that might go to Bernardo's. That side of it. You know, I think, again, it's very hard for the contemporary people to recognise the appalling conditions people lived in, in verminous, cold, damp, deeply unhealthy conditions. And in the philanthropist had great ideas of you know, getting out into fresh air. So Bernardo and others like him often organised big outings to places like Faden Boys. Again, in Night and Day, Bernardo appeared funds to organise an outing. And in 1881, he took two and a half thousand Sunday school children from this ragged school to a Thaden Boys. And he did that several times. And not only did they have a picnic, which is catered for, they come back, they are back till seven o'clock in the evening, and then they have fireworks. And, oh. you know, and literally, just if you can imagine, outside of here being full of streets, I mean, they, this would have been all housing before mm. the Second World War. Um, they were all here around the Victory Bridge. But by that time, they were more thousands of them because parents had come to pick up the children. So there we go. So, I mean, these are some of the, image, the images of our school. This is the illustration that Bernardo uses to appeal for funds for feeding the boys. And this is an image. It's after Bernardo has died and it's after this school is actually closed in 1908 because by that time, uh, these the, the authorities were building schools after the Elementary Education Act. Schools were being established by the local education authorities and so on. But these are the Sunday school children. And those would be, often be children who would work during the week. And Sunday school was the only way to get an education. Of course, Lord Shaftesbury was a great patron, as was Lady Burnett Coots. Angela, isn't it, Angela? Yes, yes. She, well, there were many, many patrons, because uh, there, there are... Schools all over. Yes, I think Rothschilds were also involved in various ways. Many, you know, many of the philanthropists of the day are attached to schools. Yes. So the the Shaftesbury Society and the, the Ragged School Union. Yes. What happened of them? Well, as the need, as basically the, after about 1909, when this school closed, they're really fading away, and then the Shaftesbury Society transmutes itself. I think you could say. Um, into an organisation that helps to look after, well, they, I'll use their term, it's not my term, cripples, a disabled, a dis disabled child. And that, that becomes its main raison d'etre at that point. I was talking to uh, an academic, Laura Mayer, who's writing a book about the history of the ragged schools, and she, she oh. says... She's in Scotland? It, she's, she's studying in Scotland, That's yes. right, yes. right. Um, and uh, she, she's remind, she, she took a point to remind me and everybody, how progressive the ragged schools were. Yeah. You know, we're, it's, it's so easy to pick, pick out from such a huge history yeah. the negative. Yes, 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 I'm sure. But so many, so many things were progressive when there were not social support systems. Yes, yes absolutely. There was uh, yeah. gr great, great levels of poverty. Yes. Um, oh, absolutely. And, and I think what's, what I, I think is, again, progressive about the Ragged School Union, it's not a prescriptive 
organization. It's not saying you do it like this. It's there as a mutual self-help and as an organization that tries to foster the setting up of ragged schools. And while they were intensely Christian, they wanted it to be non-denominational. They didn't, they did, which I think is very interesting as well. Uh, I mean, it, again, it, it's something that all too easily gets forgotten how these evangelical Christians, because I think, you know, in, in many uh, circumstances, it's now looked down, evangelical Christianity is looked on as scams. But they were real pioneers. They really believed that you should convey to people God loves you. And also, as I said, that what I think is totally important is they wanted to be enabling organisations to help people to help themselves. There's obviously this this sense of working across different communities yes. and supporting each other. Yes, to, yes. To... very mutual self-help. Yes. Right. And does that connect in with Samuel Smiles? And, uh... Not particularly that I know but... of. There's no particular link, uh, but it's... Well, I think it's just always trying to meet the need that they encounter. Because as I've sort of said, said to you, if you look at what's happening to these, these children and their families, and um, father out of work, fatherless, fatherless, father ill with pleurisy, um, and then the child, it's often said this is the case, but you don't often find it, but this boy is sent home because he had ragged clothes. So, <clears throat> you know, these the, the aim... I think it's what it says, and if you have a look at the classroom before, schools and lunch. So this is our um, classroom, and all the rooms in this building will have been classrooms at some stage. And you, you bring, you bring uh, schools uh, and yes, children in? Yes. yes, so we know that so at one stage there were about a thousand pupils on the register, and there have never been a thousand at one time. And... Again, from the attendance register, we can see that there were children as young as a few months coming. There was basically a kindergarten here as well. So that indicates that they're, they're running a kindergarten, in, in essence, so that older children don't have to be minding the younger children or mothers can go to work who have to. And then said, there were 2,500 children on the Sunday school list as well. Mm. Uh, and that's a way of, of gaining some education if you if you had to work as well. Yeah. I, I see a, a picture of Queen Victoria on the wall. So <laughs> I, was there any patronage, royal patronage? Or Not that interest? I'm aware of. Um, I, yes, there was sort of aristocrats. And Bernardo did get for his full organisation, um, he got a royal patronage in the end, which the Bernardo still have. But not specifically for the school, no. Uh, so how did you come to, to be a... I'm a museum curator, so right. um, I, mean, I came um, and uh, I particularly have uh, hang on here because uh, we have a fairly desperate need to get the building fully refurbished. We're standing now in, uh, if you look at our address, it's 46 to 50 Copperfield Road. These buildings were due for demolition because in the, in the post-war reconstruction outlined by the Abercrombie and Forshaw report, there was no green space around this area and it had been heavily bombed. So the idea was to create this linear park, which you see outside, um, and that would run all the way up to Victoria Park. And that made sense and it would run down to the canal. So these buildings were scheduled for demolition, which I think is actually a way of saving them because nobody does much of a building that's going to be demolished. So after the Bernardo organisation left after the, after the First World War, it had returned to the light industrial. They're canal warehouses, and that's very classic of a, of a ragged school. They converted to light industrial of various kinds, quite a lot of rag trade and so on. Um, so they're due to be demolished, and local activists formed a group to campaign for their listing. And uh, it was just a stroke of luck that the Greater London Council was about to be disbanded, dissolved, and they provided the money to purchase the buildings. But in the first instance, this building, number 48, was the first one refurbished very carefully so that it still looks old. And number 50 was, was refurbished later to provide offices. But the largest part of our buildings, number 46, has never been properly refurbished. So it's got holes in the roof, and our, there was a fire in the 1950s. It was really roofed there. That roof is now in bits, quite frankly. It's not watertight. We've existed for now for 30 years, 
the roof in that state and we couldn't go on much longer. We're not funded by any public body and never have been, and it's getting tougher. So we knew, uh, well, I knew on arriving here that we needed a Heritage Lottery Fund bid to, to refurbish number 46 sort out the heating, get the roof done, and to create a building where we can generate more income and be self-sufficient in the way of ragged schools. So mm. that's, that's the position we're in now. We're very fortunate. We've um, been, won an HLF award. We're in our development phase at the moment, but we hope uh, within two or three years, you know, the whole building will be sorted. And, and so if, if people wanted to give money to help the refurbishment... We, we'd say hooray! <laughs> how would they do that then? Um, get in touch with us. Um, we can look on our website. Uh, there's a way of donating there, giving there. But if they wanted to get in touch with me, I'd be absolutely thrilled. And also we do need mon money to, to keep running. You know, we, we've still got a bit of a deficit on our revenue uh, budget. So um, all contributions are gratefully received and it will help to keep alive the spirit of the racket school movement. And a building that more we look at it is unique. We are the only major racket school open to the public uh, in a way that they can learn about this movement. Is there anything that you think is really important for people to understand about this history? Well, I think it's this combination of very compassionate, I think, compassionate philanthropy that recognised that people couldn't make their circumstances better without education, support, and the ability to earn their living. And it's about enabling. It's about helping people, giving people a step up. It's teaching a man to fish, giving a man a fish. I, I have to say, if you ever want to do a ragged university event here... Oh, yeah. <laughs> We'd be very happy if you'd come along, if you'd want one. I mean, the, the, our problem, I have to say to everyone, is we, I mean, you're looking at the only full-time member of staff, yeah. not only having to keep this going. And things like, you know, I've had two gallons of water into my office. 30 windows were smashed one day. The local authority has taken away our discretionary rate relief. Really. The local authority sent me a planning enforcement notice about the condition of one of the buildings outside that took me a month to battle on. We have something called museum accreditation, which started as a reasonable scheme 25 years ago, but is now out of control. And that took me three months to deal with. Is this very uh, arduous, bureaucratic yes. process? Yes, yes. box ticking process. Six people in Birmingham will be ticking those boxes. And they'll never have come here to see what the situation is. We've got a collection left behind to us behind from previous people here, which, you know, is, is not of great interest. And I have to treat it like it's a Rembrandt. So with only one member, you know, full-time member of staff, the amount of extra things we can take on in terms of time, just time, is tricky. At the, particularly at the moment where I have to really get this Heritage Lottery Fund bid going. Well, maybe I can see how uh, I and we can support you. It's well, I'm going to see the, um, um, this, is, this is an area where we do holiday activities. Um, do... The fact that it's a living space. Yeah. For me, people, organisations and councils should be rolling up at your door because you're, no. you're looking after no. communities. No, no. I mean, I could send you all the stuff I've sent to LBTH to try and get the, the discretionary rate relief. And um, basically what I've sent has been ignored. Uh, there's a completely untransparent process that's gone on behind closed doors and they've said no. Now that's on, I think, on the basis that of the schools that come to us, most of them come from outside Tower Hamlets. Here comes the catch 22. If we were totally dependent on Cat Tower Hamlet schools, we wouldn't survive. And they, can't, they couldn't produce enough income for us. The funding system, the, the way that it's structured is well there's no funding system for us i mean we aren't uh, funded yeah, we aren't funded this is just three and a half thousand discretionary rate <laughs> and we've never been funded by anyone uh, we've had we've had grants from people and we've had up to seventy thousand pounds worth of grants from town hamlet but that's that's decayed away and it's clear that we aren't going to survive i mean we're on the margins of survival mm -hmm. that's that's what i recognize from day one and we've had some help from Tower Hamlets and we've had some grants. But the grants in Tower Hamlets is a very fractious local authority because there are factions within it. And we, one stage, we're getting £3,000 from that. Now, we offer a discount to Tower Hamlet schools. We provide 
24 free drop-in family learning activities during the year, and we keep this build, historic building going. And Tower Hamlets, its strategy for the for the Regents Canal, because they all have all the local authorities on the Regents Canal uh, were asked to produce a strategy, particularly with relation to the environment, historic buildings, and they said they we were a priority for support. So this is our store, but in our future building, this was going to become we we're going to let this area as a office space. Um, because that will give us a kind of regular, you know, what we're looking for is regular income, obviously. This is a staircase that Dr. Bernardo put in in 1895 when he expanded the school. And this is the sort of area that we've got from Bellarmine. Uh, you can see the sky through the roof. <laughs> this might be a set up to be an alternative classroom, which is used a lot for filming photo shoots. That's our problem, you see. The school's income is finite. There's only a certain number yeah. of schools you can get in through a day, certain, certain parameters during which a school will visit. It will mostly be key stage two pupils, and we were terrified when Michael Gove took the Victorians out of key stage two. And you can't expand that income. Mm. There's, you know, there's a certain number of weeks in the year, three schools a day, and we're, we're running at 93 to 95% uh, take-up. So, um, therefore... That, that was always the difficulty. But through film and photo shoots, that's an, ex that's an income we can expand, yeah. um, which is very helpful to us. Well, it seems like so many histories and cultural assets are being ignored, frankly, and, and also the bureaucracy yes. that everybody has to yes, deal with. Yes, it, it weighs you down. It's a long decision-making cycle. Yes, yes. Masses of paperwork. Yes, yeah. People distant. Yeah, making decisions, yeah. exactly. No, you've got it in one, actually. That's, that's exactly the issue we're confronting all the time. And it makes it tough. And one knows that it's, it's not going to get any easier as, for instance, you know, social welfare is being squeezed. Mm -hmm. Clearly, lots of the big trusts tend to look in that area to, to give. So it does make life tougher and tougher for places like that. Yeah. It's just surprising as well because it's not only a, a, an understanding of how the country has been built, but you're offering a place for communities to, yes. Yes, to absolutely. do, do things exactly. and come exactly. together. Exactly. No, very much so. I mean, we see ourselves very much as part of community cohesion. There's a tendency in somewhere like Tower Hamlets, we'll go to in here, um, for everything to break down into various communities. I think the great thing about this is that we are representing the struggle for free universal education. And that's something that's happening in the world today, everywhere in the world today, generally speaking, particularly in the developing world. So that's a universal story. It doesn't relate. To, it's not just one history. It's a universal history. So um, when schools uh, come, they do the Victorian lesson. And then they do the kitchen session as, uh, here as well, which is a kind of you know, interactive session. So that's the, that they enjoy as well. So they, you know, they get to understand that there wasn't a microwave. Well, exactly. I mean, it's what I call the misery of domestic life before, um, before, before electricity. Though it is funny, some, a boy, that some, some school sent us thank you letters. And one boy, they were obviously told to write a certain number of words. And one boy said it was very exciting to discover how life was before there was an you know, Xbox. Yeah, where's the games consoles? <laughs> yes, exactly. In terms of teaching, do you, do you have a sense of what teaching was passed on with reading, it's very, writing? It's basic, reading, writing, arithmetic, geography, some of the religious instruction, there'd be possibly a bit of drill to keep yourself fit. I mean, Bernardo didn't believe in over-educating people because you know, being realistic, that people, because people often ask the question, they, they're hoping that some, that some captain of industry will have emerged from these schools, where it's very unlikely coming from the kinds of backgrounds that they did. But a basic education, but he was also very hot on training. Boys were, were trained for, for some sort of manual skill and girls, of course, for domestic service. But perhaps one thing, I'll show you this photograph. Well, we're very fortunate, actually, that we have a group as run by somebody who lives over there. He, he and his group, he, he organises people to uh, clean up the canal, and he's got funds to put those floats in and everything. It's a beautiful scene. Really. It is a good setting, yes, and I mean, we're really grateful to him for doing that because that really kind of improves the whole environment for us.
So where do you, do you, do you run your events? Um, all over then, or uh, at one point uh, it was in London, Manchester, Glasgow, and Edinburgh. Yeah. And now run in Edinburgh and Manchester, right? Because the teams in Glasgow, and London, yeah. uh, went went on to do other things. I should go right and. But a similar thing to you, we, we yeah. found that the, the funding was onerous. Yeah. It also changed the nature of... Yeah, uh, yeah, you, yeah so you have, you're always having to accommodate to, 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 their, to their projects and that's what they want to do. Yeah. And um, it's quite tricky. Is this a, a book of histories? And, and that's um, images but, that were taken by some called Horace Warner around the, the Whitechapel area, a bit later than Bernardo's... Um, Period. This is Burley Doherty's book. That's based on the story of, of Jim Jarvis as expanded by Dr. Bernardo. This is number 50, which is where I've, I've never understood how he did it, but Bernardo apparently has a gym in here. It's been small gym. So again, you know, it was very into physical fitness. It seems like all the lessons of ragged schools are coming back to... Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Now um, people are, are, are desperately needing to get up and move and do more. Um, do, do you have some images? This, this image I also think is very striking. This is not, this is 19, Bernardo says 1901, and it's at the girls' village home. And um, but these, these are some of the girls there, and I think it's very striking for how the girls do not look. You can't use these, I'm afraid, because they're oh, Bernardo's. Yeah. Um, they're institutional, they don't look institutionalised or... No. Um, you know, got nice um, outfits and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we, we forget that these things came from personal relationships and situations where people cared enough yeah, yeah. to make try and yeah. make sure the opportunities were Well, I think there were very there. striking things about... There is a tendency that... I mean, there's a book that I heartily dislike, um, <laughs> which I said we've managed to lose and, um, by someone called Lydia Murdoch called Imagined Orphans it's her PhD expanded and her conclusion says that Bernardo who was so condemnatory about poor parents was given a hero's funeral that I would say is actually completely untrue because you can find anything in Bernardo's writings of various kinds where he obviously he does attack parents who are cruel who are drunken who are neglectful but from my reading, which is sporadic of night and day, um, he's mostly talking about the unequal struggle of people to survive. So I think that t totally misrepresents him uh, in that sense. And it's striking that he always uses the term fatherless. He never uses illegitimate. And also another interesting thing that he did, which is often little known about, is that after the second Ripper murder, because that was his sort of stamping ground, he um he he went down and asked the women how he could help them, and they asked him to run a night shelter for his uh, for the, for the, the, the to look after their children, and he did that. Now he never uses again. He refers to it. I've never I've never done consistently gone through uh, night and day say, but he he refers he, he doesn't refer to prostitutes. So that's again interesting. So I don't know if you'd like to have a little look through night and day because that's. Yeah. Are, are I mean, are you, are you moving? Are you... Digitized at all? No, no, no. no, no. These, but these are the journals. Of. This is his journal that he issues to. I mean, it's full. It's full of all you know. Again, technology we might not use today. Like he calls some of the kids, in, particularly in the early stages, street Arabs and <laughs> things like that. But and it's it's tales of rescue and so on. That's the Edinburgh Council. That's a slightly fanciful view of it. That's an interesting one. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is very, this is one of the earliest volumes of it. So if you want to have a quick look at that, I'm just... I do see you've got a vision for the place. And what, what would you want in regards to raising the profile of the Ragged School Museum to a, a Well, I'm just as, as a beacon of, of the struggle for free universal education um, and mutual self help. I think that in its widest sense. Well, it's it's fantastic coming along. Thank you very much, Erica. Thank you.